Um, okay, so what I actually want to talk about, even though this wonderful introduction said I'm going to talk about really practical things, I actually want to get a bit philosophical. Because I think what we currently lack is kind of philosophy. We lack the spirit level in order to really talk about the kind of things I want to talk about. I will bring it back down. Um, and so, God, I'm never going to be able to, oh, I can look at them here. That's good. Um, so first of all, the context, of course, is one where we've just gone through this massive you know, financial crisis, which turned into an economic crisis um, in many parts of the world that continue to be starving for growth. And luckily, there's lots of talk about you know, achieving this growth in a particular way. We don't want just any kind of growth. By the way, the kind of growth that some countries like the UK are experiencing today is not necessarily the kind of growth we want. You can just look at the debt to income levels, uh, very high. So that's consumption, debt-driven growth, personal debt-driven growth, which is what got us into the crisis in the first place, but smart innovation-led growth. There's lots of talk about that. In fact, that's one of the reasons that industrial policy is finally back on the agenda. It's no longer a blasphemy. Luckily, also, there's talk about having this growth be more inclusive, not just because of Piketty's book uh, on inequality. There's a big debate out there on how inequality is one of the biggest problems, so we want inclusive growth. We also want growth that is more sustainable, whether you call it green growth or whatever you want to call it, sustainable over time, so we don't just kill the planet in the meantime. And of course, for those countries like the US, the UK, um, and any country that has become incredibly financialized, where the financial sector has you know, completely outgrown the real economy, there's also lots of talk about rebalancing away from this kind of speculative uh, type of capitalism towards, if you want, you know, real industry. And this has sort of set up, if you want, the, uh, the conversation for talking about innovation again, which is what I'm going to talk about. But I really want to go beyond innovation and, and slowly, but along the way, talk a lot about inequality. And also that the real crisis today the biggest battle of all those battles is actually how we talk about things. And in fact, this is what in many ways is impeding us from fighting those battles. And I put these quotes up here by Keynes, which will show you that, I'm, again, I'm not going too practical in the beginning thinking, if you want big, just because Keynes really talked about how important it was for public policy, not just to tinker on the sidelines, not just to make things a little bit better or a little bit worse, but to really be imagining new spaces, to be doing uh, what he says here, to do those things which at present are not done at all. The problem is, is that how economists have talked about those things that are not being done at all, and hence require the, pu the public sector to come in, has been extremely limited. And unfortunately, because of this other wonderful quote that Keynes says, and he's absolutely right, which is that so many policymakers or practical, you know, also business people who think that they're just doing things on the ground, they also tend often to be slaves of defunct economic theory. So in fact, this is really what I want to do today, which is if you want to defuncticize ourselves and to really think much bigger about what public policy and the role of the state might be in terms of actually fighting those different types of battles. So smart innovation-led growth, more inclusive growth, green growth, as well as rebalancing finance. Let me just say something now in case I forget to say it later, because it's extremely important. This is what I often do when I tell jokes. I want to tell the punchline in case I forget along the way. Um, but this whole issue of rebalancing, which I just mentioned before, is actually a problematic way to frame the need for innovation policy. Why? It's not actually you know, the big bad hedge funds, credit default swaps, derivatives versus industry. Industry today is sick. It is as sick as the banks. It is ultra financialized. So I will get to this at the end, but, what, but I want to say it now because it's too easy to sort of posit this distinction between the makers and the takers without really going into depth into how it is that we've come to the point where industry itself has become so financialized, often spending more in areas, for example, that simply boost their stock options um, and hence at executive pay than in things like human capital formation, R&D. I'll get to that later, but it's actually one of the biggest problems we have today, so I want to say it up front. Anyway, so how am I going to, if you want, debunk uh, economic theory and how it talks about the state? Well, assuming that we're all rational people here and, and you know, that we have no, if you want, Tea Party type uh, people, I assume that what, you know, we all kind of think the state's important. It's not, you know, completely get out of the way or state is terrible and we just need the private sector. The problem is that even amongst intelligent people and adults and uh, wise progressives, we often have, again, a limited view because it's been so informed by this limited framework, which we can really kind of summarize as the market failure framework. 
The state should step in whenever the market fails to do something. For example, when you have a public good, okay, like say basic research, which has really high spillovers, and hence it's really hard to appropriate the returns from that, then you need uh, public sector investment. Um, that's absolutely true. You also need public sector investment when you have other types of market failures which arise from different types of externalities, negative externalities like, say, pollution, uh, positive externalities like uh, 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 clean air or uh, you know, the basic research that I mentioned before. Now, the problem is that you know, that, as well as this notion that somehow the state has to level the playing field, create the basic conditions, whether it's building infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, uh, good educational systems, them, all those things are true. Of course they're true. This is not, you know, the point is not to say that's not true. The point is that's a limited way to identify the need for state investment if you go back to that other quote of Keynes really saying, you know, you've got to imagine new spaces. You have to really think big about what you can do. Um, and again, I just want to push this a little bit further that, you know, if it's not market failure, what is it? And unfortunately, we haven't had the words to really talk about this in economics. There is actually a historian who I really recommend you read his book, Carl Polanyi. He wrote this in 1944, called The Great Transformation, where he actually shows that from the beginning of capitalism, which, by the way, is not that old, you know, kind of 300 years old, you really had a state and different types of public policies with, which actively shaped and created markets. The market actually had to be imposed. It wasn't this natural thing out there that then you had you know, public policy simply regulating or you know, impeding in you know, both positive and negative ways. The state itself emerged through massive amount of different laws, the most obvious one being you know, private property laws, as well as tariffs, as well as child labor laws. That actually shaped how the market ended up looking. Um, so the state, if you want, as a co-creator of that market mechanism is quite important. But this view, oh god, this is very self-promotional, but then again, I'm here talking to you, so why not? Um, it's a bit embarrassing. Um, uh, so what I've tried to do in this book that I wrote called Entrepreneurial State, which luckily in some ways has just become a vehicle through which I'm talking today to lots of different governments about how to change the conversation, as well as to businesses, I'll get to that later on how they might be speaking to public policymakers in a different way. What I try to do in this work uh, is to sort of apply that kind of Polanyi type thinking to really modern day capitalism, right? Especially today where so many countries, including my own Italy, uh, are looking at places like Silicon Valley, right? The hotbeds of innovation in the name of this smart innovation led growth but really learning uh, in, in some ways the wrong lessons because we haven't had the words to really describe what's happened there in terms of the public policy uh, uh, tools that have been uh, used. In fact, it's interesting that Matteo Renzi, Italy's prime minister, when he did go to Silicon Valley, the first thing he did when he came back to Italy was like, oh, now I know what to do. We just have to make it really easy to fire workers, right? So he removed uh, one of the restrictions. That there, anyway, I don't want to go into that because I could. We'll talk. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting what people have learned when they've gone to such an entrepreneurial hotbed of the world. And so um, what I do in the book is I really try to, first of all, start off with this assumption, right, that somehow these entrepreneurs, the venture capital sector, um, you know, the Zuckerbergs of this world are the really dynamic ones. And what the state did was kind of just set up, again, the rules of the game. This is Kafka, of course, with all the bureaucratic papers. Yes, he's important. The bureaucracy is important, but it's a bit boring, right? It's a bit lethargic. It's like a dinosaur. And that all it really needs to do is facilitate this wonderful creativity in the private sector. Um, and I try to debunk that precisely by looking at some of the biggest changes that have occurred over the last 200 years, um, especially focusing on the post-war period, and asking, well, who, you know, who, who were the risk takers? What kind of risks did different actors take? And when did they actually enter the game? Has there been some free riding? Has there been some piggybacking? Which is all fine, as long as we identify that as a sort of innovation division of labor. But when we completely lack the words to actually describe part of the risk takers, and this is what I'll be arguing as some state taxpayer funded uh, actors, then we get a really dysfunctional ecosystem. In a world where we all love to talk about public-private partnerships, innovation ecosystems, I argue let's be careful because ecosystems, if any of you have studied biology, will know that you can get kind of predator-prey ecosystems, you can get parasitic ecosystems, you can get new 
simplistic symbiotic ecosystem. So let's make sure we actually you know, set up obviously the ones that we think are a bit more interesting like mutualistic and symbiotic ecosystems and I only think that's possible if we not only talk about these partnerships but actually really understand what the public part brought to the public-private partnership beyond de-risking, facilitating, administering, regulating spending. Um, and so I focus on specific technological changes, not just little gadgets, the big stuff, what economists call general purpose technologies, those kinds of big te uh, can speak, technological changes which uh, really affected productivity in lots of different sectors. Um, and the first point, which is really important, and I'll maybe take it a bit slower, is that often the investments that led to advances like the internet, nanotech, biotech, we're not limited to the public sector coming in and just focusing on the really sort of upstream basic research. There was lots of upstream basic research, which was very important. But the first point there is what was interesting is that it was mission oriented. It wasn't oriented to just fixing a dip, you know, some sort of market failure. It was actually thinking of a new market, a new space that didn't exist. Um, uh, the internet, it's not that it existed and government just came in and gave you know, an R&D tax credit or just funded a bit of basic research. There was both the mission, the definition of that mission around the internet, which was related, of course, to all sorts of funding, which I'll go through in a minute, in the Department of Defense, related to the past uh, you know, sort of space race types of investments, but also lots of applied research, lots of investment in early stage uh, companies which the private venture capital industry was not willing to fund precisely because it's very kind of high risk kind of investments which uh, some early uh, internet related or computer uh, related companies wanted to make um, and I'll mention some things around BC later but so this is important which is mission oriented investments and across the entire innovation chain. Um, now as I mentioned the uh, uh, this is also early stage funding of companies themselves through uh, funding like the Small Business Innovation Research Program. And what's interesting here is if you compare the private and the public financing of companies, it's actually increased that difference between public and private funding in the very early stage of companies' formation has increased. Why? Because we increasingly have even the venture capital industry itself, which was actually set up to, if you want, provide a different kind of finance from the ones that banks were providing, which were very risk averse to these uh, sort of small innovative companies, but they themselves have become, if you want risk averse and short termists, really focusing a lot on an early exit, three to five years, uh, through an IPO or a buyout, and that's not the kind of sort of finance that these companies require when they're engaging in these big new changes, whether it's clean tech, biotech, nanotech, internet, um, you really need long-term patient committed finance. Um, and when you look, I mean, I often use the iPhone as a, you know, an example because it's the, if you want, uh, object that we often associate with places like California and Silicon Valley. So much of the funding that actually led to this smartphone, in fact, lots of companies now produce smartphones to be smart and not stupid, were in fact publicly funded. Okay, so whether it's the internet, uh, GPS, touchscreen display, the Siri voice activated system, in fact, trace the research back to these different types of agencies, which I also had in that earlier uh, uh, figure there. So DARPA and the Department of Defense, the CIA, yes, the CIA has one of the biggest public venture capital funds in the world, called Incutel, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, which also funded Google's algorithm. Um, but you know, this starts looking a bit scary, doesn't it? So CIA. Army Research Office, Department of Defense. Um, and so one of the first things that people say is, yeah, but you're just talking about the military industrial complex, right? And we don't like that. This is all defense. Um, and so the first point is that's not true. That has been, well, it is true for the iPhone and all those kinds of technologies. But what's interesting is that this, in fact, has become a model uh, in the US. And don't worry, uh, very soon I'll be talking about the US as a problematic country. This is just the story you don't hear about the US. Um, this has become a model that has also been applied to health. This is the figures for the National Institutes of Health, as well as energy. I already mentioned ARPA-E, which is today in the Department of Energy, trying to do the kind of big thinking, out of the box innovations for renewable energy, which DARPA did for the internet. This just shows you just how much money these public labs have spent in the US, the National Institutes of Health, on really financing lots of the innovations behind pharmaceuticals and um, and the biotech industry, even after the crisis, spending close to 32 billion uh, a year, that's a lot of money. We often don't hear about that, 
Uh, it's also been shown that this kind of financing has in fact led to some of the most radical revolutionary drugs in this sector, so the new molecular entities with priority rating. Um, now, all these kinds of funds, whether it's the ones that funded the internet or directly funded early stage companies like Compaq and Intel, which got their early money from uh, the SBIR program, are really direct financing, right? This is not about, again, tax credits of different types. This is direct, and what's interesting is you know, the story that you're often told about the US being this market model. Instead, what I've just shown you is this has been directed, mission-oriented, strategic money from the government, the public sector, to sectors and specific firms. And you look across the world, and this varies greatly. Canada, in terms of comparing direct versus indirect, indirect is tax credits, right, incentivizing uh, companies simply by, if you want, uh, making, things, uh, making it uh, cheaper to invest is very high, the indirect financing, very low, the direct financing. The US, the exact opposite. Uh, hugely you know, direct in these kinds of investments I've shown you before. And this is really important because you know, lots of countries try to think about how to incentivize innovation, especially today where we all want this smart innovation-led growth. But the evidence shows that in fact, you know, private business investment, which by the way is what Keynes really worried about because it's the most volatile part of GDP, it's too pro-cyclical, it's very volatile. Private business investment doesn't invest simply where it's cheap. You know, neither Bill Gates nor Steve Jobs nor any of the sort of big thinking entrepreneurs around the world in different sectors invest simply because it's cheaper to do so, because governments reduce the cost or just reduce the red tape. They invest where there's sort of big opportunities, where they foresee opportunities, technological and market, to invest. Of course, you don't want you know, ridiculous types of taxes around that, so it's good to have smart taxes, but just by reducing the cost of innovation, there's very little evidence of additionality. In other words, R&D tax credits often do not make R&D happen that would not have happened anyway. What you need for the business sector to actually you know, um, increase its investment, which in Canada is a big problem, I've put down the figures here, which are in Jonathan's uh, great paper that he's distributed for this conference, um, is 0.88%. Uh, it's one of the lowest, sorry, uh, compared to sales. So less than 1% of R&D spending relative to sales for companies in Canada in terms of how much they spend on R&D. That's extremely low. It puts you on one of the lowest within the OECD, like Italy. I think you're just as high as Italy. Um, so in fact, those countries that assume that all you need to do is incentivize it through tax credits aren't able somehow to increase that spending. And it's not a surprise, because what we found through interviews, there's some great studies on this, is that you have very little relationship between entry into new industries and current levels of profits. What investors are thinking about and, and entrepreneurs entering sectors are the expectations about the future uh, profits and growth. And so the big question for policymakers should be, what should we do? to increase those opportunities, which in the end are the key drivers of investment, as opposed to just thinking of how to make profits higher today. Um, so it's not a surprise that, in fact, some of the countries that have the lowest uh, GERD rates, go, uh, gross R&D spending, um, total R&D spending to GDP, are, in fact, those that have a low public spending, which then also that don't kick start that uh, private spending. Now, of course, lots of economies, as I mentioned before, are thinking about green growth and trying to kick start uh, renewable energy, and I think it's really important, first of all, to, to say something specific about green before I go into these technologies, again, in case I forget to say it later. Um, so first of all, we see similar patterns in green that we saw in biotech and nanotech and the sort of internet economy, which is that upper right-hand quadrant <laughs> uh, doesn't have much uh, private money. Um, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. But I want to say something specific about it now because, in fact, what many of these technological revolutions that I put up before, like even the mass production revolution, required was not just investments in the technology itself, but also big thinking, again, think of that Keynes quote in the beginning, uh, around uh, public policies which then also allowed these new technologies to get fully deployed throughout the economy. And one of the issues today is that the IT revolution, which, is just, you know, which happened recently, um, you know, the first PC just being, what, in 1974, and then the IBM PC in 1981, so, and you know, the internet, the World Wide Web not being that long ago, that revolution has not really been fully deployed yet. There's lots of re you know, really interesting studies on that. We're kind of halfway there if you compare ourselves to what electricity was uh, also after just 20 years of 
being around. It took kind of 40 years, for 40 to 50 years, to really have a full effect on all different sectors. So one way to think about green, even though I'm about to talk to you about you know, green technologies, is potentially uh, uh, providing a new direction for IT. And why do I say that? Mass production, which I just mentioned, the way that it got fully deployed throughout the economy was through policies like suburbanization. People didn't just wake up and want to go live in the suburbs. Right? Suburbanization actually came out of sort of big public policies. Forget whether you think it's good or bad. The point is suburbanization was a result of public policies, which actually then allowed mass production to get fully deployed into all sorts of different sectors. Um, and today, one way to think about green that I think is really important is, is precisely that, sort of a new direction for the IT revolution to get fully deployed. Um, this is just very important because, again, lots of these technologies which I've been mentioning, like all the technologies behind the iPhone that make it smart, were in fact picked, right? You know, so the, the point is not picking or not picking, it's how to talk about this directionality. What should be picked, how do we do the picking, how to bring top people into government, which can even talk about specific sectors, have that expertise, um, as, and, and also think about you know, the full deployment of these technologies and what kind of direction we want economies to go in. And to have the debate between the politicians, the businesses, civic, uh, civic society, as opposed to thinking you know, that we somehow just let the market, if you want, decide a direction, and we just kind of lay down the foundations. Um, I'll come back to that towards the end when I kind of raise this issue of directionality. Again, anyway, so when you look at green, what's interesting if you uh, actually use some databases that are out there where you, where you can compare kind of private and public sector uh, spending, what's interesting again is that you have very little, as I said, private money in that upper right-hand quadrant, high capital intensity, high technological and market risk. This data here is looking more, if you want, in some ways at the deployment of green technology. What's striking is just how little private money there is today in uh, sort of the full deployment of you know, solar and wind and how, how much money is actually coming, for example, from these public banks that also economists don't have much uh, way to talk about except through sort of the development process looking at particular developing countries. Certain public banks, like the one in China, the China Development Bank, the one in Germany, the German Development Bank, uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, did I mention, yeah, KFW, BND, oh, BNDS in Brazil, have become very active, actually, in thinking you know, big around uh, green tech and investing almost eight times as much as the total worldwide uh, private sector. Uh, this is the data here for the German uh, public bank called KFW, just to leave the US for a minute. And what's interesting here, again, is that you know, on the one hand, it's doing what Keynes said, which is one of Keynes's key points was that government should be counter-cyclical, because right, the private sector is too pro-cyclical, but also that it, 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 it's investing this money in a particular direction, right? Because Germany has now this energy vend policy, which is very much thinking of the green direction and a way to transform the whole country, and its public bank, which is providing this kind of patient, long-term, committed finance, uh, is, is helping to provide that direction. Which, you know, in the US we don't have public banks, but there's this patient, long-term, committed money going through these different types of public sector institutions. Um, and so what's interesting, though, is that when you have these kinds of investments, we really also need a framework through which to talk about them. And by just thinking about the KFW as simply fixing a market failure or just trying to get us out of the recession through, if you want, counter-cyclical spending, really doesn't, doesn't tell us that much about what it has done or looking at DARPA or at the SBIR programs in the U.S. looking at it just in that framework, I don't think, is, really enables us to talk about what actually happened there. And this is also very important because when you have this kind of active government spending, it often gets accused of crowding out or, or of picking winners. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the actual analyses that, um, that are introduced in order to you know, make those arguments, you really see that, again, it comes from a particular type of framework. So if you take this more Polanyi-esque uh, market shaping, market creating framework, uh, where you understand you know, the rise of places like, well, what's happening today in China as well, as pushing new frontiers of markets as opposed to working within them, that should actually bring us to indicators through which we might assess the activities of these tools in terms of creating new spaces that actually didn't exist. Instead, even the Keynesians themselves, uh, you know, some of the people I also respect very much, if we think about today's sort of more vocal Keynesians like Joe Stiglitz or, or Kr Paul Krugman, you know, at best what we're hearing is that we need this counter-cyclical government in a time of like recession when you have underutilized capacity. We need a stimulus 
to create this kind of multiplier effect, and it's, 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 it's going to get us out of this terrible rut that we're in. But the qu big question is, well, what should we do then in the boom? Should the state just completely withdraw? And what's interesting is that so many of the investments I've studied myself and that I showed you before actually happen in the boom, right? You know, the internet investments actually happen in the boom. You have the state leading away, the way even in the boom. And so this is the issue that when there's difficult, new, interesting, visionary, mission-oriented areas, it has often required the state, regardless of the business cycle, uh, through its different types of institutions. You know, when I'm talking about the state, it's not Big Brother. It's this decentralized network of different types of public actors to actually make these decisions. By the way, these are not always good decisions. They can be critiqued. Shale gas, which, you know, there's lots of controversy around it. Uh, you know, fracking shale gas was a, almost 100% funded by the U.S. government. There's lots of debate around that. This is, well, debate around whether it's a good thing or not thing that today we are focusing so much on that particular type of extraction. And so this is one of the ironic points that by not having this debate, actually the state, when it does these things in places like the US, it's not really a result of a decision amongst the population to spend, if you want, uh, taxpayer-funded uh, dollars in that particular direction. It just happens. And we then also, as I said before, don't necessarily have the tools to evaluate it. Um, anyway, moving on. Within green, you know, again, in all these sectors, they have never come about just by uh, public actors. I've been talking about the state simply because we don't have the tools, I think, to talk about the state. It's always done alongside also private actors. Um, but one of the real dilemmas today, which I sort of alluded to in the beginning, and I want to focus on that, is the, in some ways, the uh, reduction <laughs> of commitment by some leading uh, private companies in terms of, if you want, co-investing alongside the public sector in some emerging important areas like uh, clean technology. Don't forget the reason I have up here, uh, you know, where are Xerox parks and Bell Labs today in the energy sector is of course uh, one of the key private sector laboratories that led to lots of the technologies that today we associate with that whole Silicon Valley area was in fact, you know, say Bell Labs which was a private sector research and development laboratory inside AT&T, which was a big monopoly in telecommunications. And it's interesting also to see where those investments came from. They actually came out of a sort of negotiation with government. So not just a new deal in a Keynesian sense, a deal, deal making with government. AT&T was a big um, monopoly and government basically said, you know, we could bash you tomorrow through antitrust policy unless you reinvest your profits. If you reinvest your profits back into production, big profits because you're a monopoly, um, and you know, into big things, big innovations, alongside us will help you. Lots of the Bell Labs investments were co-funded by government. Then you know, you're okay. <laughs> you can survive for now. Um, and in fact, so Bell Labs itself, which is a key investor, there's all sorts of books about Bell Labs in the private sector, emerged itself from a tense negotiation with government where government felt confident enough if you want to make these demands. And what I really think we're missing today is not just that kind of confident entrepreneurial kind of investments, which as I've shown have been kind of leading and transformational in the history of modern capitalism, innovation-led capitalism, but also this kind of serious deal-making between government and business. Um, and so this is just showing you some data on how much the private sector is actually spending on green tech, but you shouldn't just take this data here as a, as a given. There's all sorts of different indicators one might look at. But you know, the, the big question I think that policymakers have to ask themselves is how to actually strike better deals of that uh, uh, type. Don't forget that even, um, even the Bay-Dole Act, for example, the Bay-Dole Act in 1980 was introduced in the US to commercialize uh, great science, right? The idea was we have all this wonderful science, but it remains in the academies and the universities. We want to commercialize it, so we should allow publicly funded research to be patented. The Bay-Dole Act did that. Uh, in 1980, and inside, the, um, inside that act, it's a long uh, piece of legal material, it actually says, well, we better make sure that we you know, don't screw up here. Uh, this is publicly funded research. We don't want the taxpayer to pay twice. So for example, if you have some drugs, some medicines um, uh, that are taxpayer funded, publicly funded, the government should have the right to cap the price of those drugs to prevent that price to sort of go to infinity. Well, government has never actually exercised that right that is in that act. 
Okay, so I think part of the real issue today is also how to set up, as I mentioned in the beginning, a bit more symbiotic and mutualistic innovation ecosystems or public-private partnerships in general. And it's fascinating to see that even when it's written in the, in the books uh, where people foresaw this as a problem, uh, it's, it's actually not exercise. So I want to sort of focus on this because I think this is one of the key issues today in terms of bringing the innovation debate together with the inequality debate. Um, which this is the data from uh, a Piketty, which I don't want to go into his whole theory, but of course we know that what he's been arguing is that we're sort of going back to uh, feudalism in terms of uh, levels of inequality, and he argues this is, uh, you know, is going to require something like the wealth tax, and he specifically looks at um, also taxes like capital gains tax and how it's fallen over time, and uses that to. Uh, uh, well, his, his whole theory is based on the rate of return on capital uh, superseding the rate of return on growth in this uh, second period. And then his solution to this wonderful book in the end is about having uh, you know, uh, taxes like the wealth tax. And he doesn't talk much about capital gains tax. But what I try to do in the book is ask, where did those changes come from? So he does look at how capital gains tax has fallen over time. And if you look at why it's happened and how it relates to everything I've just talked about, it's actually fascinating. So it was actually the National Venture Capital Association in the US, which in the late 70s lobbied very hard in the name of innovation, right when we started having all these big debates about the innovation economy, the knowledge economy, information society, that they were the most important actors, they were the entrepreneurs, the risk takers, and so that government had to reduce, if you want, the cost um, and incentivize that innovation. And they very successfully, in just five years, uh, managed to get capital gains tax to fall by 50%. Um, now, uh, you need a communist like uh, Warren Buffett to come along to say this you know, is quite useless. He very explicitly here says what I said before, which is actually you know, capital gains tax, he never even looked at it when he invested, even when it was 40% back in 1976, and that's exactly the year that they started to uh, push for this change. By 1981, it was... Uh, 20%, it didn't affect any of his investments. And this is really actually what we see in the innovation data itself, what I do for real when I'm not writing books like this that are more almost political because I'm trying to change the political debate. I, I do economics of innovation and look a lot at those kind of entry and exit figures that I mentioned before, relate them to what we know about uh, current levels of performance and expectations about future performance and innovation. And as I said, there's very little uh, relationship between current profit levels uh, and entry into these new sectors, kind of confirming what Warren Buffett here is saying. But this issue that I mentioned before about the degree to which companies today are either hoarding cash, in Canada you're close to a trillion, what are you, just over $800 billion worth of hoarded uh, inert capital in your companies. So hoarding, so not reinvesting the profits back as government demanded from AT&T when it was a monopoly or also just spending it on areas like share buybacks. So Bill Azonik, a colleague of mine, has written quite a lot about this. Uh, there's a great new, um, well, relatively new article of his in the Harvard Business Review in September on this, but, um, and we've written a paper called Risks and Rewards around this. Uh, you know, what you should worry about is that black line there. So not only the absolute figure, which is three trillion uh, in the last decade, Fortune 500 companies have spent on share buybacks. Why? To boost their stock prices, boost stock options, boost executive pay. Again, one of the key uh, factors that the whole, if you want, Occupy Wall Street movement around the world, uh, called in different ways, has worried about. But the black line is what you should worry about, which is the amount of, co of money that companies have spent on these share buybacks called here repurchases and their R&D spending. Okay? That is a huge problem. Uh, which, you know, if you think of also some of the debate around skills that are out there, so, you know, technological unemployment, all these robots and technology, uh, and, and all these people without the right skills, and so they're getting left behind. Well, hold on, you know, where do skills come from? They're an endogenous product of investments, and as companies themselves are, you know, not spending as much as they did before on long-term areas like human capital formation, like R&D, this also reduces the skills. So it's not just about introducing government programs to get us the skills to, which are very important, to allow uh, workers to update themselves with these new revolutions, but also really to challenge how profits, if you want, are being spent. Um, and why is this important? Well, because innovation, it's not just collective, 
as I've been talking about different actors, and we don't talk enough about the state. It's not just uncertain, uh, you know, very, very risky, so fundamental uncertainty. It's also cumulative, right? Innovation today um, depends on innovation yesterday. So it's not a random walk, okay? There's not an equally likely probability of it happening at any moment in time. It often happens in clusters. This is one of Schumpeter's great points. And it's kind of persistent and path dependent. Uh, and so it's cumulative, you know? So think of it as a cumulative distribution curve that you might remember from statistics. Well, this means that over time, you know, the pot underneath, the integral underneath, you know, sort of gets bigger and bigger. And so one of the problems when you don't have kind of a holistic view and identification of all the different actors that are contributing to this process, if we only hyper, uh, how do you say, uh, hype up some actors, whether it's the individuals like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, and not the whole sort of ecosystem around them, what I think has actually happened is the ability of, of some actors just to capture a much bigger part of this integral, think of the integral, the returns underneath, than what they've actually put in. Um, and, and, you know, this, this is a huge problem, also in terms of if you want funding innovation in the future. So had, if you want some of the investments uh, uh, in, in the, the, the internet and GPS and all sorts of technologies which led to, again, the smartphone or the companies themselves. In fact, this argument in some ways is more uh, pertinent when we're actually looking at the investments in the companies downstream. If there could be ways, whether it's through tax, <laughs> whether it's through income contingent loans, whether it's through equity, whether it's through retention of some sort of golden share of the IPR or any means, to make sure that we actually have you know, a real revolving fund uh, that's gonna make sort of future revolutions easier. Um, let me just say something on that because when I, what do I mean by these downstream investments? Just think of some of the more recent ones that have hit the media. Solyndra, right, Solyndra Solar Company that the US government gave 500 million to, guaranteed loan. You know, that's also direct through a, through a, through a, through a loan scheme. Uh, failed miserably. It's been used almost as a modern day Concord example of government failing, how stupid, a bunch of bureaucrats that don't know what they're doing. Almost the same amount, just a little bit less, 465 million, was given to Tesla for the Tesla's car. Huge success. Now, any venture capitalist will tell you this is normal. For every success they have, so Kleiner Perkins, venture capital company, investment in Genentech, biotech company, very successful. They had all sorts of other failures. That's just normal. That's part of the innovation game. Innovation is very uncertain, uh, and, and you just have to be willing to put up with that if you want, if you want to innovate. Well, it's just as true for government, right? But because we haven't admitted that government has been, in fact, not just a spender, not just a de-risker, not just an administrator, but a lead investor, both in specific firms, specific technologies, creating new sectors, we haven't sort of gotten this kind of risk-reward relationship right. Um, and so is it right that, you know, or is, it, is government going to be able to do the kind of Tesla type investments uh, if they're not able to think of this, if you want, investment as a portfolio? It's interesting, actually, if you look at the Tesla investment, there was, just like I mentioned before in the Bay Dole Act, there was actually an agreement within that, that had Tesla not paid back the loan, which they did in 2013, government would have had the right to retain, um, to have three million shares. When the loan was taken out, I can't remember if it was the end of 2009, early 2010, the price per share was about $9 per share. By the time the loan was paid back, it was close to 90. Now, the idea was only if Tesla didn't pay back the loan would government have some sort of right to the shares. But, the, you know, why? Why not actually allow government anyway because it took this major bet, maybe, to retain some of the shares, not to line the pockets of civil servants, uh, but to put it some, to some sort of innovation fund for a time that could, in fact, continue to sort of take these big bets, right? But again, I don't want to argue that there's only one way to sort of think about this, but the point is, if we want, if we want government to make those kind of bets, either we go back to the tax system we used to have, another communist, right, Eisenhower, general, Republican, remember what the top marginal rate was, close to 90%. Right? So either we go back to that, I doubt there's going to be much political will to do that in any part of the world, or bring capital gains tax back to 40%, or with the tax system that we currently have, if and when they're actually paid, right, because there's lots of avoidance, these same companies that have benefited so much, Google, Apple, Amazon, it's not me telling you this, this is front pages of the papers every day, don't pay much tax, but even if they did, 
because so much of the innovation narrative has actually been around detaxing them, so these different types of taxes falling, I personally think that it's very hard to think of the tax system itself to alone be able to sort of enable this kind of real risk taking within government. But that's a debate one might have. Um, let me just skip ahead. Um, so really, what I've been trying to say is the questions we should be asking, and this isn't just for innovation, if you think of innovation in the big thinking way, where even something like suburbanization becomes a social innovation uh, on the part of society and thinking how to steer things. You know, it's not, about, it's not about should we or should we not pick. All the really interesting things have always been part of you know, picking certain directions. We should have more debate about you know, which kind of directions, but also how to attract uh, 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 people into government that also have expertise into these different uh, areas. And this is a real self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, that the more we have this very limited, boring, lame way to talk about government, at best in fixing market failures, the harder it is to actually bring into government the kind of people that A, have much knowledge about particular sectors. How many top scientists do you know who are leading government um, institutions? And this is, again, what's interesting in the US that somehow, sometimes they manage to do this when they don't get the market rhetoric um, to dominate too much. So because the Department of Energy is currently very mission-oriented, they're able to attract a Nobel Prize-winning physicist Steve Chu to direct it. He just stopped about six months ago, who then set up ARPA-E. You know, or the Brazilian Development Bank, which is very active in the Brazilian space in these investments. One of the top jobs you can get in Brazil as an economist is to go work in that bank, not to go work for Goldman Sachs. So this issue of how to build um, public organizations that are also willing to explore, willing to uh, do the whole trial and error thing, but also be able to evaluate these investments when they happen in a way uh, that really uh, takes into consideration that they're you know, pushing the market boundary, not working within it, something that economists don't have, and also this whole risk reward point. By the way, in terms of the evaluation, this also, I think, relates to another point which I didn't mention, which is you know, when government or even the third sector, the Atkinson Foundation or the Wellcome Trust in the US or you know, these third sector organizations want to get involved in a particular space, I think it's very important to go back to this issue of market shaping, market creating. So it's not just about you know, funding great new drugs in the pharmaceutical industry, it's redefining that space. You know, why not lifestyle? Why isn't there serious research and activity by the public sector and the third sector organizations and really redefining and researching into areas like lifestyle, uh, which could really extend the boundaries of what we mean by the whole life sciences sector. So this kind of courage of working outside the boundaries of a space that's defined by uh, private actors is very important. Um, so you know, what I've been trying to sort of argue again is that where we need to begin is the, this cartoon image, <laughs> this very problematic uh, image that we have of the state as somehow lethargic, going back to history where we see that in fact some of the biggest innovations that we often attribute to the private sector require this direct mission-oriented strategic investments alongside the private sector. But we know the side of the private sector, we've got millions of business schools all around the world that teach also businesses how to think out of the box precisely because they think they're the key actors. We haven't uh, thought enough about the state's role and that this constant image we're fed of this kind of lethargic uh, state in some way uh, is not only problematic in terms of funding the future innovations, because some countries then don't get uh, you know, these, these active uh, investments, whether it be Canada or Italy, but it also increases inequality, as I've been mentioning. And I'll just finish with something which is, I was actually a history major in undergraduate before I um, went on to study economics as a master's and PhD. And I specialized in a sort of specific part of history in those years, which was Latin American history. And one of the best books I read on Mexican history was by Rodolfo Acuna. It was called um, Mexico Ocupada. And it was fascinating because he begins with this cartoon image, right? the lazy Mexican, you know, the Mexican sombrero under the palm tree and said, where did that cartoon image come from? And he basically argues that it was fabricated in a short amount of time during the Mexican-American War to justify a massive theft of Mexico, which later became America, so Texas, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and you had to, in order to justify that theft, depict this actor, the Mexicans, as lazy. Right? Uh, we are more productive. This fertile uh, soil will go nowhere under these lazy bastards. 
And what I want to argue, or what I've been arguing, is that you know, it's, 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 it's sort of a similar situation. This depiction that we're fed constantly of the public sector worker uh, as, as important, yes, but a bit boring. And all the really interesting stuff happening in business is not only dysfunctional in terms of how it prevents us really getting proper public-private partnerships to fund the big stuff in the future, but it's also justifying a theft. And that's a very strong point. It goes beyond uh, the innovation of public-private partnerships that we all want. It's justifying a massive theft. And I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. <laughs>